Well, good evening. Uh, today is August 21st, 2023. Hard to believe, hard to believe it's August 21st. You are part of Rowan County's uh, County Commissioner meeting tonight at 6. We are so glad that you're here with us tonight. Welcome. Hope you find your uh, time profitable and hope you feel welcome here tonight. Uh, we are honored to represent you, and so as we begin, uh, like we begin every meeting, we do a couple of things. Uh, one, we're going to have a pledge, to a, a pledge of Allegiance. We're also going to have our chaplain come up, Chaplain Taylor. Chaplain Taylor is going to provide for us, if you hadn't been here before, what's called a solemnizing prayer. Now, solemnizing prayer means that's not for you, the audience. It's for us as the commissioners. Uh, because we seek wisdom in everything we do, and uh, we don't know a better place than through our chaplain coming and praying wisdom over this meeting tonight. So, Chaplain Taylor, if you'll come. Commissioners, if you'll join me, we'll get started. Pray. Lord, we're glad to be here tonight. We're glad to be here on behalf of our county commissioners. Say, Lord. We thank for the dedication they have and the work they do, Lord. We ask you to give them the wisdom they need tonight as we have this meeting tonight. Uh, each day during the week, we pray for them and ask you to give them the wisdom also, Lord, do what needs to be done for this county, Lord. Blessings, wisdom upon them tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Chaplain Taylor. We appreciate you. All right. Um, got a few changes uh, to the agenda. We've got some additions that we've been provided with. Um, First addition is Woodleaf Community Park Change Order. That'll be Consent AA. The second one will be, uh, let's see, request a uh, public hearing originally scheduled for 8-7 to discuss the offer by Fortius Capital. Uh, we are going to um, Fortius to notify the EDC that it's withdrawn its uh, offer to purchase, so that'll be consent AB. And then uh, the next request, Aaron, um, request in the board to authorize Aaron to execute state building reuse grant extension amendment for continental structural plastics, that'll be AC. And then we will delete on the regular agenda item C. Millbridge, Millbridge Speedway, they have um, withdrawn their request, so we'll, re we'll remove that one. I got all that right, uh, Madam Clerk. All right, everything good, uh, Aaron? We're good? All right. Okay, do we have a motion to... Um, yes, yes. Chairman, uh, we, we probably are going to need to move our special recognition uh, down... Uh, somewhat uh, because of the, the some of the kids that play in uh, middle school ball uh, have games and they're going to be a little bit late getting in here. Yeah, about and we'll just we'll call it a floater. All right. All right. That's fine. Is that okay? We'll fit it in somewhere uh, as soon as they get here. All right. Any other changes, commissioners, that we know of? All right. Um, Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Pierce, were you? Did you have something? Nope. No. Yep. We worked that. Yep. All right, uh, motion to approve uh, the agenda as uh, amended. So moved. And all in favor say aye. Aye. All right, thank you. And then uh, let's see. Uh, all right, we've got that. And then uh, uh, the minutes are already on there. So we'll move. Well, we had special recognitions next, but we're going to move that along. And we'll go straight to public comment. Uh, Gord, uh, Gordon Halp. Yes, yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Uh, what I'd like to bring to y'all's attention tonight is an incident that happened personally to me 
in regards to uh, discrimination going on in our public restaurants slash convenience stores. Um, I was denied public access to a rest, uh, restaurant restroom. Um, and so doing so, I was informed that they have no public restrooms, okay? Once I was denied access, I turned around and walked off toward the rest uh, restaurant my, itself to purchase something, which I'd already purchased gas. Um, a gentleman came out of the restroom. Thought that was pretty weird. So went and got my a rest, uh, restaurant and went back, asked to speak to the manager. Manager come out, I asked him, I said, sir, do you realize that you're required by North Carolina law uh, to have public restrooms? He said, no, I'm not, uh, because we are not a rest area, we're a convenience store. I said, no, sir, you're a restaurant. North Carolina law requires you to have a restaurant, one male, one female, per building code in North Carolina. But needless to say, um, I was kind of distraught at that situation as it was. What made it evenly worse, the restaurant manager continued um, to make comments in regards to, if you would like to use the restroom, I would let you. And I went, sir, do you realize what you just said? I said, that is discrimination. I said, I was just denied access to your restroom. And now you're telling me that you give access to your restrooms. And he stated that he does this occasionally as a courtesy to his customers. What made it even worse, the young lady at the register uh, was a black lady. The gentleman that came out of the restroom was a black man. And I was denied access to that restroom. And I've been a business person here in Rowan County for over 30 years doing business in and out of the county for what I do as a living, okay? That's bad enough. Now, as I've informed you uh, through building code, I'm very familiar with building code. I do it as a living, okay? Building code violation requires section 2902.1, minimum number of fixtures, 2901 table requires one female, one male restroom to get your CO for that business to operate, okay? Based on that alone, they are locking the doors. They literally locked the doors. I found out since then, based on uh, other people I've asked questions to, uh, there's been a modification to the building in itself to where they have access, to, or the ability, I should say, to lock the restroom. Originally, the restrooms were accessible, had an open atrium to go in and out of the restrooms. They've since modified the building where they put in a frame door and they can lock the door to lock out their customers from access to the restroom. That was never permitted. That was never approved, obviously, because it's a code violation. I've since spoke to uh, Thomas at the Building Inspections Department, Director of Inspections. I have made him aware of this, and um, basically he's telling me that um, he's not sure if they want to tackle that. And I said, Thomas, I'm just asking you, um, this falls under your jurisdiction as the director of inspections. When a code violation is brought to your attention, it is not only your responsibility, it's your job to look into these matters. The, the building inspections are clear in North Carolina. If you operate a restaurant, you have to have a restaurant open <clears throat> to the public. You are allowed to put signs up that states customers only. Okay, that's valid, paying customers. But they are right now in violation of North Carolina building code where they are locking the restroom. And due to this, um, I went online uh, looked up certain uh, restrictions or, uh, from a legal standpoint, things that kind of fall into place. Business owners also cannot violate civil rights laws when they say no to someone. If they open up restrooms to customers, 
It needs to be for people without regard to race, religion, sex, age, or abilities. All right. I haven't even addressed uh, ADA. They're locking the doors, obviously. Handicapped don't have access to the restrooms. Uh, in the state of North Carolina, the only business that must provide public restrooms, meaning for their customers, not the public at large, are sit-down food establishments. So I ask you, this was uh, by a lawyer, this is from a lawyer, if the building has a restaurant or more than 20,000 square feet, restrooms for customers are required. So I'm asking you to address this, look into it, and for the people of Arlington County and myself, um, this needs to stop because it is not up to the managers of the stores or the owners to hand pick and decide who they let use the restroom. Code dictates that they are open to the customers. I can't say public, I wish I could, but I can't. But as for Rowan County, I'm asking you to instruct your own uh, director of inspections to enforce building code in Rowan County when it's brought to their attention when there are obvious code violations. Mr. Help, thank you. Thank you, and I Appreciate ask you, it. Mm -hmm. thank you for your time. All right, next, Spencer Dixon. Spencer, welcome. I'm here to make comment on the human trafficking study that's going to be talked about and considered later. Um, I want to bring to the commissioner's attention that I think Family Crisis Council should be involved inside the study. You have Project Light and a member from the county commission, but Family Crisis Council has been providing domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking services in Rowan County for over 40 years. We have institutional knowledge of what the barriers already are. We already have a leg forward in kind of understanding what the problem is. And so by leaving Family Crisis Council out, you're actually going to start a few steps backwards from where you are. Like We already have multiple issues that we're already aware of. Rowan County 911 doesn't have any type of log for human trafficking calls. So I can go to Rowan County 911 every year. I can ask them for how many domestic violence-related calls. I can ask for how many sexually assault-related calls. But by asking for human trafficking-related calls, they don't have anything to pull that report. It's this type of institutional knowledge that we understand what the barriers are. In addition, the majority of survivors of human trafficking are going to go through our agency to receive services. We provide the shelter. We provide the transportation to your long-term residential facility. We are going to assist you getting that 50B protective order. So I just feel that in order to give the study the best chance to create the greatest success and have the best results, Family Crisis Council and its institutional knowledge should also be included in the study group. Thank you. Okay. All right, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? No. It's amended. Yes. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. We still don't have kids here. All right, we'll move on uh, to item number four. Let's see. All right, uh, public hearing for consideration of temporary ordinance for race to the River 5K. Who's, uh, who's doing that one? This is Kyle Harris, Town of Spencer. Anyone, anyone? Yeah. Is someone here for that? Table it to the next meeting. Well, let's uh, let's table that item for now, and we can come back to it if someone comes. We'll move on to item uh, B. Uh, Aaron Poplin, uh, public hearing for ZO three dash twenty three. Aaron, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
So we have request uh, Z0323, a request for a mobile home park to rural agricultural. Uh, the owner of the property is William Knowles. The applicant is Tanya Poole. The property is located at 2935 Old Union Church Road. And this is tax parcel 607-011-50s and 1. So this property is a approximately 16 acre parcel off of Old Union Church Road. Most of the property is zoned rural agricultural, but there is a three acre section of the property in the bottom left hand corner here that is zoned mobile home park. Uh, this is a existing park. It was developed a little bit before 1990 uh, by the current owner of the property. And it's a, it consists of four mobile home spots and then the house for the, uh, who, for the owner of the property. And right now they're seeking to rezone this property from mobile home park to rural agricultural as they're getting up in years and they're considering parceling off some of these homes so that they can sell the lots to the people who live on them now. So just some pictures of the area. You can see a couple of the houses that are in the mobile home park now. This gravel drive here is the one that goes back to the other two lots. It's a little hard to see them further back there. And you can see the home of the uh, owner of the park. So as far as plans and policy, this is in area two of the Eastern Area Land Use Plan. Area two encourages medium density residential development throughout the area. And then when opportunity for new residential developments exist, traditional and conservative subdivision designs using current minimum lot standards are appropriate. So consistency with the requested zoning district, uh, the rural agricultural district is to develop <clears throat> to provide for a minimum level of land use regulations appropriate for outlying areas of the county. These areas are typically consist of rural single family housing, larger tracts of land for agricultural purposes, and incidences of non-residential uses in intermingled. Multifamily uses are discouraged in this district, <clears throat> and most intensive land uses, uh, <clears throat> this district would provide for a protection from most intensive land uses, and provide for a, a variety of home-based business opportunities and other non-residential uses deemed appropriate throughout the special use permit process. The intent of this district rely upon development standards to protect residents from adverse impacts allowed of non-residential uses. And the most intensive land uses are not allowed in this district. So we break it down to the table of uses. The biggest difference you're going to see between Mobile Home Park and RA is that Mobile Home Park is the only district that allows for a manufactured home park. And in this case, as manufactured home parks require a special use permit, but to apply for that, you need to have at least six acres. So the current manufactured home park that's out there, it's grandfathered for what it is, but it's not a large enough uh, zone size to actually request a special use permit for an increase in the amount of lots out there. So they more or less are just kind of where they're at. By uh, going over to the RA district, what that would do is it would grandfather the houses that are out there. So they're allowed to stay out there. They become legal non-conforming uses. And so if they wanted to do like an expansion to a house or if they wanted to replace the house, as long as it's done within 180 days, they'd be able to keep what's out there or expand on <clears throat> or do additions to their houses. So looking around the area, it's mostly residential out there with some wooded lots. It becomes a little bit more clear when you see the overhead view. If you take a look at the zoning, this area is predominantly rural agricultural with the only non, with uh, the only parcel that's not rural agricultural is the existing mobile home park, the mobile home park off of Gaither Road, then you have to go all the way back down to Bringle Ferry Road to get a little bit of CDI. So as far as impacts on facilities, the RA district wouldn't increase the number of homes that are allowed on the property. And the houses currently use a community well and septic systems. Back in June, the planning board had a courtesy hearing for this. Uh, nobody spoke out in opposition of the rezoning and the planning board adopted the following statement of reasonableness and consistency. So, as far as staff comments, the homes in the existing park will become legal non-conforming. So that means they can replace the homes that are out there as long as they do so within 180 days. And they'd be allowed to do additions to them if they'd like to as well. Uh, the existing manufactured home park zone is not large enough to allow for an expansion of the park. 
So the rezoning was going to be required either way to change up this property. And then this is a straight rezoning, so there's no conditions that can be applied to it. Procedurally, you're looking at a, uh, a public hearing, adopting statements, and then approved denying or tabling the request. If you have any questions, both me and the applicant are here today. Aaron, <clears throat> okay. So this is going to rural agriculture, and the minimum size lot for that is what? Out there is uh, 20,000 square feet, so just a little bit less than a half acre. So, so if I bought a piece of land, and I'd have to have a half, yeah, sorry, a half acre to build a new home. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Okay. Yeah, that'd be the minimum. Okay, and that, and these homes will meet that then. If they uh, if they cut it out, that's what they, that's the size they'd have to do, or at least the minimum size. They may go a little bit larger than that, okay. depending on how they cut it up. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? All right, if not, uh, applicant, would they like to? Anything they want to add? Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll conduct a public hearing. We'll open the floor for any comment that there may be someone here. I know no one spoke at the planning board meeting. Anyone want to speak on this? All right, seeing and hearing none, we'll close the public hearing. I'd like to offer up um, this uh, statement of reasonableness and consistency um, based on the following. It's compatible with other surrounding parcels. Current uh, MHP zone allows no room for expansion. The change to RA will allow subdivision of the parcel to sub supplement residential growth. Uh, make that in the form of a motion. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Uh, do we have a motion to approve ZO 3-23? Move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right, well, thank you. Do we have visitors here? All right, well, come on in. Y'all want to join them out front? And Mike, grab that mic on the way by. We are honored this afternoon to have the Rowan County, I know Salisbury hates that, but it's the Rowan County Pin and Under Girls Champions for, of, of the world. That's right. They won all that they could win uh, with the 10 and under. Uh, these girls um, were undefeated this year. They um, have have played in how many tournaments? Three? You have to go to, okay. what states were they in? What's, were well, most of them in North Carolina, and then the last one was, I know was in Tennessee. Okay. The other two were here? Okay. And uh, so th these girls have just uh, taken on everybody that had come come down their way and had beaten everybody. Um, these are the 10 and under. They don't have a chance at this age to go to the World Series, but that will be next year. And uh, 
So we're we're real happy that they're here. Uh, if if you are a parent, do we have do we get many parents to get here tonight? If you are a parent or a grandparent of one of these girls, would you stand? And we just like to we appreciate what you have done in support of these kids, and uh, they have just been excellent examples. Um, <clears throat> this team has been led by three uh, leaders here. Coach Deal, um, probably I should have started the other way, but I'll, I'll do it as Coach Deal and, and uh, 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 Coach Malky and then the uh, Mrs. Malky, who uh, probably should have uh, introduced her. But if y'all could come up. Uh, uh, Want to read this? Hmm. <laughs> we have a we have a proclamation uh, for you folks, and then we uh, we're going to introduce the girls after that. But um, this is from the Rowan County Board of Commissioners uh, proclamation honoring the 2023 Rowan Little League 10 and under softball team. Whereas the Rowan Little League 10 and under softball team under head coach Brett Mulkey, assistant coaches Greg Deal, and super coach Jacqueline Mulkey is hereby recognized and honored for their 2023 victorious season. Whereas by extraordinary efforts, the following members of this dynamic and talented team are to be congratulated for their remarkable and triumphant season. Kristen Johnson, Jacqueline Coden, Catone, Abby Miller, Harper Deal, J. Lee Nixon, Kaylee Clawson, Jean, uh, Gina Smith, uh, Zoe Carell, Stella Drew Smith, Nelson Leonard, Peyton Mulkey, and Gracie Cooper. And whereas due to their hard work, dedication, and their exceptional chemistry, this outstanding group of girls won the North Carolina 10U All-Star District 2 Championship, the North Carolina 10U All-Star State Championship, and the 2023 10 and Under All-Star Southeast Regional Championship during the 2023 Tournament of State Champions in Clarksville, Tennessee. Whereas the individual contributions from each team member were critical to the successful season and the tremendous commitment and excellent performance of these young Rowan County girls, along with their coaching staff, have proven to be the source of admiration and inspiration to the citizens of Rowan County. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Rowan County Board of Commissioners does hereby honor and congratulate the 2023 Rowan Little League 10 and under softball team and the coaching staff for their incredible achievements and com commends them for their display of sportsmanship, leadership, as they represented Rowan County. This, the 21st day of August, 2023. That is in the form of a motion. All right. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Jackie, since I know that you'll do it right, <laughs> will you? Uh, would you introduce? the players, and we have a, a copy of this resolution for each one of them. As I call your name, girls, come up to the front, okay? Stella Drew Smith. Harper Dill. Lawson. Awesome. 
Emma Smith. Debbie Carell. Debbie Nixon. Jacqueline Catone. KJ. Debbie Carell. Sorry. <laughs> I was looking at the wow. Mm -hmm. Jack. Jack is white. Yeah. Regular agenda A. Nobody That's here. the 5K, and there won't. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to move back to item um, A on the regular agenda. J. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, we, we've reached out. Ed Muir reached out to uh, Kyle Harris, um, and he has a Town of Spencer Historic Preservation Commission meeting tonight. So that's the conflict. We did this last year for them. This is a 5K. They run out to the river and back, and under the North Carolina DOT event guidelines. When the road ends in their municipal district, they're required to get the county permission for any piece of the road outside that district just to make sure we're okay with the request. And then DOT has the authority to actually close it for the race. And so this does, it's a temporary ordinance. Um, so we scheduled a public hearing. You can open and close the public hearing, take any comment. And then the requested action is to approve the ordinance. Uh, let me pull it up. Um, yeah, it's in our packet here. Yeah, the uh, ordinance approving a temporary lane closure. 22 in? Yeah, okay. and so, but he apologizes. He okay. had that conflict. Fine. We did it last year, and he wasn't here, and so I don't know that he anticipated he would need to be here. That's fine. All right, thanks. Um, all right, we will open for a public hearing. Is there anyone that wants to stop these people from running? <laughs> All right, not seeing any, then we'll close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners, do we have a motion to approve the ordinance uh, for the Race to the River 5K? And, and it's all in favor, say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. Is Ed? St yep, Ed's in here. That's right. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Shane Stewart, uh, SUP 01 23. No, nope, 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 nope. Huh? That's the wrong one. Uh, Z04-23. I needed to keep keep moving. Yep. That's a great segue, though, because for the board's benefit, too, um, 
this is the first action, a legislative decision, much like we make a rezoning or a text amendment. That will, that's a legislative action. So this needs to come first. There is a special use permit request on your agenda. So that is predicated on this passing. So if it is, then we'll move forward to the next agenda. And I'll touch on a few things as I go through <clears throat> this material to try to keep them separate um, for, for your benefit too. So the, this request is from Bowtie Properties LLC for a portion of their land at 350 Porter Road, and it's a tax parcel 401019 and a part thereof. If you look at the screen here, you'll see the subject parcel ID identified and outlined in yellow. We're focused on what's in the crosshatch area. That total track is six and a quarter acres, and we're focused on a rezoning application for the crosshatch area that is about four acres. Current zoning that you see in the background is a gray. That represents rural residential. 8582 is in blue, and that is the proposed designation <clears throat> for the area in the crosshatch. If you look over to the far left of your screen, you see Porter Road. This is an interstate uh, service road that parallels 85. If you look up here in the vicinity, it's just uh, extends here north towards Speedway Boulevard. But if you come back down here to the site, the state maintenance ends before you get to this subject track. So that's the area we're looking at here. <clears throat> just a few stats on the, the property. It's about a third of a mile deep, right at 1,700 feet deep. Average width is about 181. And it shares a common border here with the ED2 district of about 1,000 feet. So it'll make more sense as we move through it, but this is the first action in zoning a property and then ultimately requesting a amendment to the plan unit development for the Speedway Business Park. And this is our plat from the 2005 recreation of Speedway Business Park where the county created a 61 acre industrial park, largely centered also around the uh, small racetrack here, referenced as the quarter midget track for go-kart racing and Speedway Boulevard was developed by the county and then you see these arrangement of lots around the park that were offered to sell and to date, all have been sold, less these two frontage pieces. And of course, the county still retains the, the track property and its lease to the Quarter Midget Association. And for reference here too, this is lot five. Bowtie Properties owns this parcel, lot seven, and then eight and nine that have since been combined. And where we're looking is this adjoining tract here for reference. That blue area that's, going, that's proposed to be rezoned borders lot five through lot eight. In a rezoning that it's a legislative action, it does not have a site plan element. We don't talk about background information or potential claims of use, but I feel it's important in this case also just to provide a little context while we're rezoning half the parcel and what brought us here. Staff report goes into a lot more detail. We talked about that a little bit back when we amended the covenants, and that was before the board in February of this year. But had a little uh, buffer intrusion that came from lot five into this subject rezone area here with the drive access and some improvements here. It required 40 foot undisturbed buffer on the back side of all lots in the park on the north side, and had a Again, that introduction there that staff became aware of last year. Next slide here. If you look one parcel down to the east or on this drawing here, this is south, this is lot five, this is lot six. LGC Holdings is the property owner here. And you can make out a little difference in roof line. They added about 6,000 square foot without permits. And we found out about that too. And real nice folks we worked with, they got a survey performed. Good news, the building's not in the buffer, but to have a little area that kind of crept slightly into that buffer. So Bowtie Properties, owners of that property to the back, this subject tract here, 
decided that they wanted to try to take the, the deep dive in and try to fix this for lot five, which they own, lot six, their neighbor, and expand the park to now pull those lot lines all the way to the rear and zone this area. So the first step was the covenant amendment. The second step would be rezoning. The third step would be the HUD. And then we'll talk after that in the next item. So <coughs> context. And I think it's important also to note, what if the special use permit is never materialized? It's never acted upon. Well, one thing I believe that will address that directly is a development in the ED zone requires access to an interstate service road of 100 feet. And it doesn't have access on Porter Road on this subject track. So it really couldn't be further developed until we get into the other option, which is the planning and development. So long-winded context to give you why we're here and some other relevant information <coughs> about the property and history. So let's look out at a bigger picture of the area and same four acre area outlined in yellow in context that you see Speedway Business Park here in the blue. It also connects to other properties here collectively. It's about 92 acres of economic development to zone property. You see Coons Elementary behind in red. Also on the north side of that, the Rowan RV that broke ground is in the paper here this week. So that area is zone CBI in red. It's 411 acres. We have a relatively small pocket of rural residential. It's very deep, provides a nice little um, adjoining 1,000-foot shared access here. And even on the front side, we've got a couple of tracks here, two houses. These are zone commercial. CBI comes down to Dillard's, so it's really surrounded with the exception of Stafford Estates behind. That was platted 93, it's 93, also lot subdivision, zone RS. Turning now to the land use plan recommendations, the first one uh, is located in an existing commercial industrial area, which is the purple part of the map. And then you see these, well, at least on this side of the map, this line here represents the 85 quarter. The, the west area plan, it goes beyond the screen here, but we're also within that quarter area. So this request would be consistent with that. And then the previous zoning actions, one of which was the 85 ED2 development in 2000. As with any rezoning, we send notice to adjoining landowners within 100 feet, which are represented by the property owners here in blue, and post a sign on the property, and for this action also an ad in the paper, staff receive zero phone calls and or emails, and no one showed up at the planning board to speak either. And the planning board recommended approval unanimously. We do have a statement of consistency and reasonableness for your consideration here. One, through and three, one, two, and three. And lastly, after a motion to consider the statements would be a motion for the request. Any questions of the board? I'll answer, Shane. Sean. Um. <laughs> um, no, the, the buffer that's being created, that would also be between and the residential area. So, on the map. I don't want to, for the record and also for the board's benefit too in your deliberations and statements, the required buffer is 40 foot by the 85 ED2 standards. So any additional claims with the, the next item, that is subject to the special use permit procedures if this so is a, as as it stands right now forty foot buffer would apply yes okay thank you 
Anything else for Shane? All right. Anything from the applicants at all? No. All right. Uh, let's see. So we don't need to do a public hearing here, do we? Uh, what not? Zoning action. Did you say yes, sir, or no, sir? Yes. Yes. Because it wasn't. Zoning part. It wasn't on here. Didn't say anything about. Uh, let's see. All right. All right, so we will uh, open the floor. We'll have a public hearing. We're going to make some changes here to the zoning. Is there anyone that would like to address this issue here tonight? All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, let's see. I'll offer up uh, what was developed by the Planning Board Statement of Consistency and Reasonableness. Um, I make this as a motion. Z04-23 is consistent with the East Royan land use plan is reasonable and appropriate based on the following. One, parcels immediately south of the applicant are already zoned 85ED2. Two, it will allow applicant's parcel to be eligible for water and sewer. Three, the use is consistent with the Speedway Business Park, which borders to the south. We have a second. Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Then we have a motion to approve Z04-23. All in favor say aye. Aye. Shane. So this next one is a quasi-judicial hearing. So the hearing for consideration of SUP 02-23 is now in session. We'll focus on an application submitted by Bowtie Properties to amend the plan unit development for Speedway Business Park on tax parcel 401-019 located at the 300 block of Porter Road. If you feel that any member of the board may have a conflict of interest in hearing the case, please address the board now prior to any testimony or information being presented. When the board enters into deliberations to decide the case, no further testimony may be presented, the board will render one of the following three decisions. One, approve the permit as requested or with additional conditions. Two, continue the request or three, deny the request. All parties who plan to testify in this case may come forward to be sworn in. Those who testify must state their name and address at the podium for the benefit of the board's clerk. All material presented must be given to the clerk and will become part of the record. This board can only accept sworn testimony. No hearsay evidence is admissible. And Shane Stewart, Rowan County Planning Office, 402 North Main Street, Salisbury. Let me pull that up a little bit. Yeah. Is that better? Yes, thank you. A little closer. All right, now that we've rezoned the property, there's an application here to consider for the special use permit request. All right, same map, just focused on this area here in the crosshatch. So the unveiling of why, why we're doing the rezoning would be, it's a little bit hard to tell, but you got a better view in your packet, but this portion of land here, this four acres, is proposed to be distributed to the adjoining properties as such in this map. And in the report, the corresponding starting here at lot five, this area here is about 1.1 acres that would be added, and that's Bowtie Properties owner. LGC Holdings would be 1.4. Continuing down, the next tract, which is lot seven, Bowtie owns uh, seven-eighths of an acre, and then lastly, about a half acre. The, this request is termed a plan unit development which is just a fancy term for us a subdivision. It could be residential, commercial, mixed. In this case here, it's just a business park, one 
one proposed um, master plan that comes in, and this is a request to add this acreage. So now these lots, the rear property would go all the way projected to the new rezoned area. As conditions of approval, if the board approve this and just through the compliance with zoning and subdivision standards already um, established, this would have to be combined by deed to not create tiny little tracts of land that are not connected to the whole. So Porter Road is the frontage out here of this track. This would remain RR, it's not rezoned, so it could receive a permit for residential development. And then these portions here, the first lot would pick up an existing, what was termed a residential storage facility. It could also have other uses now that it's zoned ED2 in compliance with the zoning standards, covenants, anything else that would apply. And <clears throat> lot six and so on could be developed with additional improvements on those lots, whether it's an addition to the building or a standalone structure in compliance with the ED2 and covenant standards. Also, I should note from the 2005 plat, the very eastern limits have a 150 foot buffer from the original plat against the Stafford Estates residence. That is continued in this proposal, really that this back half of lot eight, there's, there's nothing except for this small corner that's even uh, outside the buffer area. So that's a maintained distance all the way back to this point of 150 feet, Stafford Estates and also Coontz Elementary. The minimum buffer requirement <clears throat> would continue along this line here at 40 feet. That now is the, the new perimeter north and west of the revised plat. We'll talk a minute about the additional buffering here uh, shortly, but anybody have any questions so far about the, the scope of each little piece being added to the adjacent track? No longer would this be Porter Road, it's going to come through Speedway Boulevard. Here's a close-up of the proposed expanded buffer. As a condition of approval back when the county developed the quarter midget track and also the Speedway Business Park, it was a self-imposed standard that if within the 40-foot area, the retained vegetation is not sufficient to achieve what was termed a type B buffer, which is a, from the ordinance standard, it's an 80-foot section, but it has lots of uh, trees, shrubs, and a fence. But the standard adopted was a 40-foot section. Within that 40-foot, you apply the type B buffer standards. So the applicant here is proposing that same approach on what has been um, the intrusion into that buffer by the, the new area added, and now that neighbor behind would have a type B buffer, not 80 foot, but 40 foot. This is the dimension here, and it's consistent with what we've already adopted before. Against that neighboring property line, you, you see this area here, there'd be some undeveloped section, sodded, and then an arrangement of, these are canopy trees, down here you see red maple, willow oak, some crepe myrtles, evergreens, green giant, Nellie Stevens. It's a pretty thick buffer. In addition, on the back side of that would be a six foot fence. So they're gonna see a heavy screen there. And this would be a similar approach to if those, neighbor, if those adjoining tracks were ever expanded, how much would be retained? 40 foot supplemented where needed, to create something that is achieved in this manner. Right now, Porter Road doesn't go far enough to develop any more land behind that. So the interesting thing too, if you look at Porter Road and it dead ends here, at least state maintenance is a gravel drive serving a few houses, this, to take advantage of something eight or 1,700 feet deep, this is a good way of doing that. You can come off the backside of these tracks. That buffer now 
that we're discussing here is on the back side of the property in this little section behind the building. So there are some buildings. How do they get to those buildings? Are you saying there's buildings behind there? One. There's one building behind, but it's it would now be accessed through this would be the new parcel line. This line is eliminated. So this is the new property. No, I'm talking about residential homes back there. That's a, there's not any residential homes close to this, is there? There's three right here. That? Okay. <clears throat> It's hard to see in this image here, there is an open area. So the buffer would be applied right here. Well, I just didn't want them to have to spend any money if there wasn't any residential homes back there. Who owns the The current owner would retain ownership of that area zoned RR that we didn't approve or we didn't zone earlier. It's retained as RR. They could sell it, but it could be developed with one house. Here's an excerpt of the covenants. It was filed 627 of this year. It reflects the the owners that sign, including the county, amending the covenants to allow for properties to be added to the park. This is the same list we looked at earlier, but now we don't have to worry about access to the service road because we have a developed property that's going to be served by the existing internal road and not Porter Road. We went through the, the uh, land use plan recommendations. So again, this request is consistent with those requirements and the same notice included both rezoning and special use. With our quasi-judicial process for special use, we do need to adopt findings of fact. Staff does have example findings to pass out to the board for your consideration as example only, should you choose to um, provide that or use those. And we would need a motion to approve deny our table, including any conditions, which I did note a couple in the report. One, ensure that that revised plat is uh, recorded with the Register of Deeds. Uh, record revised plat. And all the combinations that are proposed therein. Two is the type B screening requirement. Again, continuing that thought from the Original park, and specifically this would apply currently just to lot five. Lot six through eight is heavily wooded. It would only apply for future development there. And then <clears throat> number three, should there be any change of use for that storage structure that it would be subject to zoning, building code, and covenants? And also, we need to readdress that Building that's there has no access to Porter Road. It needs to be addressed off Speedway Boulevard. So those are all conditions for consideration. And Bill Arntz here with uh, Bowtie Properties, Hank Niblock, their attorney, and also uh, Victor Poplin. So any questions? All right, anything further for Shane? All right, if not... Uh, then we will conduct a public hearing. Well, tell you before we do that, if uh, if any of the applicants have something to say, yeah, outside the public hearing, uh, go no, ahead. I, I couldn't agree more with what Shane said. I think he put everything uh, in a real good nutshell and kept it real simple. You know, we know we're not messing with the traffic. We're not impacting that in a negative way. Um, it's not going to distract the character of the surroundings. In fact, I feel like it's going to enhance it because we are pushing that bus buffer so far back. Far back. <clears throat> uh, there's not going to be any noise and that kind of thing for uh, 
a problem for the neighbors, uh, I guess that would be to the north, uh, the residential homes that are up there. And there won't be any traffic or excessive problems, and it's not going to create a visual, a negative visual impact. In fact, what it will do is create a positive, a positive one. So we're not going to displace animals and that kind of thing like you normally would see in a development. Um, as you look at that piece of property that Shane pulled up to the right side of that, which is, is that west or east? West, right? Yeah. To the west, it's relatively undevelopable. So, I mean, I, th I think we're actually doing a, a service to the county by maintaining some really nice open space. So that's really all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we will uh, conduct a, a public uh, hearing now. I do have um, a bill you just spoke, Victor Poplin. Victor, how are you? Welcome, good to see you. I'm Victor Poplin with Select Properties of the Carolinas. Been a broker owner for 25 years. I was asked by Bowtie Properties to, to take a look and see if any of the neighbors would be impacted or, you know, would they devalue the property by what they want to do. And I can only see that it would increase property values. I've looked around and spot checked what had been sold lately. And I've sold some property actually on Peach Orchard Road, which is across from Dillard's. And in 2018, it sold for 300, but now the value is over 500,000. So, far as this being expanded, I don't see an issue. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. All right, those are the only folks we had signed up for the public hearing. Is there anyone else? All right, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, all right, we've got a little bit of work to do here. Let me see. Guys, you want. Does anyone else want to read? I mean, I'm happy to read it. Oh, I'm good. All right. So uh, we're going to... So you have them? Okay. All right. We're going to vote on findings of fact here. Uh, one, the development of the property in accordance with the proposed conditions will not material endanger public health or safety fact the request will allow four additional acres to be added to the speedway business park which is previously approved and as um as cupo 704 fact this request eliminates two buffer encroachments and establishes new screening and buffer requirements for adjust adjoining properties in fact further development on the subject property will be subject to zoning and building inspection requirements uh, two, the development of the property in accordance with the proposed conditions will not substantially injure the value of adjoining or abutting property or that the development uh, is a public necessity fact. Uh, the North Carolina real estate broker Victor Poplin provided testimony indicating the amended plan unit development would not negatively impact the value of adjoining properties. Then three, the location and character of the development in accordance with the proposed conditions will be in general harmony with the area in which it's located and in general conformity with any adopted county plans. In fact, the subject property is part of an existing 96 plus acre 85 ED2 zoned area and adjacent to a 411 acre CBI zoned area. In fact, this request is in conformity with the East Area Land Use Plan based on being in an existing commercial industrial area and within the I-85 corridor. In fact, revised parcels, <coughs> excuse me, comply with the 85 ED standards for development listed in section 2134 of zoning ordinance. Were there more? If there was more than that. Okay. Six facts in this. Oh, I see. Well, you had it listed different. Okay, I'm good. All right, I make those in the form of a motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, and then we have conditions. 
Um, let me read the conditions. The conditions, assume, assuming the zoning is approved, that would provide expansion opportunities on three of the four lots and eliminates buffer encroachment on two of the lots. Uh, staff encourages consideration of the following conditions of approval, and I make these in a form, well, I'll, I'll read the conditions. Uh, record revised plat with the Register of Deeds Office and ensure a combination of parcels as to not create any new parcels of land. Two, type B screening requirements within the required 40-foot perimeter buffer are required for new development when existing vegetation files that a screen view from uh, adjacent properties, requirement, requirement applicable to the western and north line of the revised lot five and any future development on lot six through eight. And third, additional development of uh, or future change of use for existing storage structure on revised lot five is subject to applicable development regulations and building code requirements. The structure will also be readdressed from Porter Road to Speedway Road, and those would be the conditions. So then uh, do we have a motion to approve SUP 02-23 with those conditions? Move. All right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Shane, are we doing this right? All right. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, well, thank you. Well, in the end, it works out, I guess. <laughs> I'd just like to say one thing um, for Shane and the owners. I really appreciate the um, trees, the canopy trees that are added to what is normally a few crepe myrtles and those skinny evergreen things. Um, <laughs> so thank you for doing that. It's going to make our county more beautiful. Yeah. Good to hear. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Uh, Commissioner Kasky. Welcome. You. We're glad you're here tonight. Good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. All right. So this... Uh, <clears throat> Human trafficking proposal. Uh, it's a proposal for a study group. Um, so obviously, I think everyone's familiar with the uh, the movie that's got out there, uh, Sounds of Freedom. I saw that movie recently, and uh, I know we're not doing movie reviews, but I encourage everyone here to see that movie. Kind of um, interesting that I that I ran into uh, Jim Duncan with Project Light on a totally unrelated matter. A uh, little tour that we were on, <clears throat> we kind of started talking about it at the same time. And, uh, you know, I asked him about some things his organization could use or the county was doing, and he mentioned a few things. And it really got me thinking of, um, you know, are we on the right track here? What are we doing? Um, the original idea was to come up with a task force, but I think that after discussion and talking, the task force is probably <clears throat> something that would come later. Um, it may be in the form of a task force or even uh, the form of an, uh, an advisory committee like we have with other things. Um, you know, I have, uh, in my job in law enforcement, I have dealt with a few cases of human trafficking. It's not something that I, um, is my, under my normal um, thing that I do, but uh, on patrol, you know, you never know what you run into. And interestingly enough, <clears throat> the very the last one that I dealt with had some ties to Rowan County and Davidson County. And obviously, I'm not going to talk about the details of the case, other than it was a um, rival gang had an initiation, and part of their initiation was to kidnap the girlfriend of the other gang member, and then they took her to sell her, and the process led us through here up, up to Davidson County. But <clears throat> fortunately, she was uh, rescued, and that didn't happen. Um, there's a lot of things that, that go on that um, people aren't aware of. And, you know, <clears throat> sometimes I think if people were aware of everything that was going on, they would 
walk around depressed all the time, like most law enforcement officers are nowadays. But um, this is one thing that really uh, is something that we need to look at and work on. Um, interestingly enough, um, some of the, if you look at the thing that we had put together, uh, some of the areas of interest that, that our study group wants to do, um, we're going to want to look at the uh, funding mechanisms and see, you know, if there's funding from the county, funding from grants that we can get, um, community awareness aspect of it, uh, research interview, identify resources, uh, and then what's enforcement efforts that are currently going on, um, research the need for the task force, and then collaborate with community partners. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Dixon had spoke earlier. We actually had a list that we've already got started on of some, some people to reach out to, some different organizations, and the uh, uh, Family Crisis Council was already on there. Um, you know, DSS Health, uh, Terry Hess House, Capstone, uh, Recovery, uh, Hope and, uh, Rowan Health and Ministries, Healthy Rowan, I just talked to, to Alyssa about something they're getting ready to do before the meeting. And so, <clears throat> you know, we want to we want to go out and interview those groups, talk with those groups, um, inter interact with our law enforcement, um, not just our sheriff, but our agency, but our and the sheriff, and but also the police chiefs, and see what everyone's doing. You know, we're not here. We don't want to try to rebuild or uh, re reinvent the wheel, but we need to find the areas that we are uh, lacking in. And you know, we may go through this and find out that people are duplicating services, and um, you know, we originally talked about having a um, coordinator that would work for the county that would interact with all these uh, different folks, and it would be a point of contact. So, uh, for instance, you know, I didn't know that we didn't uh, log, 911 didn't log these things. So um, if we had a coordinator, for instance, then that would be somebody that you'd be able to talk to because uh, you know where to go, and they would have access to, to um, all the other resources. And like I said, that could lead into a... Um, an advisory committee or a task force involving uh, a lot of these groups. And so I know I've talked with some of you and you're very passionate about the, um, the uh, issue also. Like I said, it's really a, a scourge on our country. Um, a lot of the um, Hispanic community, for instance, you know, they're afraid to talk to law enforcement. And so they're, they're really uh, a group that's paid, preyed upon a lot. Um, but it happens at every level. Anybody, anyone can get, kidnapped and brought into this. Um, you know, Greg and I went to a, a dinner the other night where we heard a very compelling uh, story from a survivor um, over at um, the Project Light dinner. So, you know, I think it's something we need to look at. You know, our country and our county, we can do better. This is not something that should be going on here. You know, slavery of any kind is, is wrong and shouldn't be tolerated. And so I think this is the first step in the process, um, you know, we can, we can, um, fortunately, we've, we've been blessed recently with a lot of new businesses coming here and expanding, um, and we need to leverage those with what's, you know, better things for our community and better resources, and, and as people move here and the population grows, these kind of crimes are going to increase. Um, you know, I've heard one of the issues is I've heard different statistics of what's going on from different groups. So every, I think different groups have different ideas of what's happening here. So we sort of need to get everything, I think, lined up into one. And obviously the county being the largest uh, governmental body in the county or um, in the county and um, probably the most resources and the ability to get those grants and things. So I think this is where we should start. Uh, and I, you know, I look forward to having this process, we could work, work, this will take a few months. I mean, it's not something we're going to be doing overnight because we've got a lot of groups to talk to and interact with. Uh, something that we'll work on for several months and then we'll come back to the board. Ultimately, it'll be uh, our board as a decision of what to do. Um, this is just the first the first step. And the, really the reason that I wanted to bring it up is one is for the awareness because this is something that's out there right now. It's a sort of a hot topic. We want to um, take advantage of that. The other is, and the other reason is I don't, I don't want to use up a lot of county resources doing this study without 
talking to you guys first and letting you guys talk about how you feel about it because, you know, we could spend a lot of time and effort working on it and then it's not really materialized at the end. So um, I think we should do it the right way, um, getting this study group together and working with all these different agencies and find out what they're doing, find out what their needs are, and then uh, come back here and, and make the ultimate decision as a study. Thank you, Mike. Um, is there anything you need us to do tonight, or Aaron, is there anything we need to do tonight other than uh, bless this effort um, in the study group? Yeah, I think the only thing we really just approval so Aaron, you know, can um, work on it. I think he's got uh, a, a plan for her to go to, um, is it Columbus County? Columbia, South Carolina shadow uh, a person down there that works for their county and something they're doing. Um, Who is that, Mike? Or is it? Devon? Devon. Okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> She's going this Thursday. And so, like I said, there's there's some uh, other counties that are doing some things, so we're going to go see what they're doing also, so we don't have to, you know, like I said, reinvent the wheel. And there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of good work going on by a lot of organizations. Um, and the reason that we kind of went from the task force to the study group idea was that uh, I've been on some task forces, and when they get so big, it's kind of hard to function sometimes. At the end of the day, this is going to be a uh, county thing, so um, we need to reach out to these groups to get their uh, expertise and what they need and what they're doing. Um, but we need a really a smaller group and um, uh, to get the study going. All right. Well, can we uh, can we do a motion of support for this? That'd be all right. Is that okay, Aaron? Yeah. All right. Um, so we'll make make a motion of support. I make a motion study that group. we should support this effort to form an advisory board uh, when the time is correct. And that I really do appreciate Commissioner Caskey reaching out to these different organizations instead of doing like so many other people do, just jump in the pool and figure out they can't swim. Make that formal motion. I second that. <laughs> Not sure which part of that was a motion or which part was comment. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll take it all. All right, we have a motion and a second. Mike, thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, Mike, we appreciate your passion on this. All right, Anna. Give us the good news. So we'll start with our July um, expenses. Yeah. And they are um, down from last July by $371,000, which is about 3.5%. Um, and they're represented by that little triangle at the bottom there. The revenues, if there's no questions. Next, there we go. Um, and then revenues are down quite a bit, but it's the ARPA, the ten million from ARPA that is not in FY twenty four's budget. So that's to be expected. Um, so, but they're rel I mean, they're up from twenty two's numbers. So I think, um, but within reason of twenty two's numbers. Okay. To the next is the cumulative property tax, and this is through June. Um, and so overall, through June of 22, um, FY23 was up $3.4 million, $3 million, or 3.77%. Our cumulative sales tax, and these are numbers through May, we're up 4.3 million overall from FY22 or 12.2%. And if you look at the month for month, and I don't know why that says April. One more. That is not the right slide. I will tell you and I will get the correct slides for you guys. So May is up updated them before I printed them this morning. <laughs> May is up 3.5%. Um, 
I mean, $185,000 or 5.5%. Let me check on, should, I'm so sorry. I printed these this morning because I was out of the office on Friday. And so I'm not sure if I should be reporting you April or May. And she's updated my slides while I was out on Friday. So um, either way, we're up a little bit from 22 in April and in May. So then the next thing is the quarterly investment report. Um, so we have currently... Um, 36.7 invested in treasuries and notes, um, 60.3 in our um, NCCMT account of our total portfolio, and 3% is in a money market. We are currently working on moving that money market into some different things because it's not earning as much interest as the other accounts. So we've done that in July and August. So this is as of June. Um, keep in mind in this total portfolio that $46 million is from proceeds from the loans that we've taken out. So that money will get spent over the next few years as those projects um, happen. But, um, you know, it's our revenue at this time. So it's, you know, it's in these accounts. Is that in the NCCMT account? Yes, it is. So when you say you're looking to move money market, how much? So we had $6.5 million sitting in a money market that was in a couple of different things. One was in the risk fund. Um, one was um, maybe a little bit in the land field. And so we're taking those items and putting them in NCCMT because they earn more. They're going to earn more interest there, and there's no point in them not earning as much interest as possible at this point in time. In the NCCMT, is that liquid? Yes, it's okay. got a one day turnaround. Yep. So it isn't a six month no. and we're becoming less Correct. liquid. Okay. That's why we try to keep as much there as we can because they have a good interest rate right now and it's it's easy to get to and easy to transfer. We can do it within one day. Okay. Okay. I will. I apologize for those other two. I think she might have updated them before I um, printed them off. <laughs> All right. Any red flags? We always ask that. Not, not that I'm aware of right now. Yeah. We just say they, they're still coming, right? That's right. I keep waiting for that sales tax to really change, but it has, I mean, it's still trending above 22, so. The figures we figures we're looking at today are from April yes. or May. So those on your slides that he was showing were from um, April. Yes, I had printed mm -hmm. off the May ones because she must have updated them on Friday, and I apologize for that. Um, but those figures, they were showing that they were up to just from looking at them. So it takes about two months to get that turnaround from the state. That's why they're so behind. Um, so she must have got them this week. and. You know, agenda deadline, I can't get those numbers to you guys that quickly. So, yeah, she must have got them in this week. Cut off if federal funds to the of over the deal. Oh, that's over. So we're, we're waiting for the backlash. <clears throat> Thing. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, one thing you might think about is that I think uh, student loan payments are starting back up like in October. A lot of people haven't been, I guess, had to pay those for a couple of years. Hmm. So that may have an impact. That's a great point. Loans. Well, lady and gentlemen, um, I thought we had a closed session tonight. No? Okay. All right, then, Craig, do your thing. Move it. We adjourn. All right, second. All in favor, say aye. aye. All right, thank you. Thank you all for being here, and please be safe.